Uh, namaste and welcome everybody to the uh, Transitional Artificial Intelligence Research Group Seminar Series. This week we have uh, Arpit Kapoor, who is from our School of uh, Mathematics and Statistics. And uh, Arpit's uh, research area is uh, uh, in the area of deep learning uh, with uh, variational inference and applications to climate and hydrological problems and modeling. And uh, Arpit is, uh, began his uh, PhD with the uh, area of uh, variational recurrent neural networks and application to cyclones. And this paper has been published in the journal Environmental Modeling and Software. Arpit, you can begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I'll just start uh, by introducing the uh, topic that I'll be discussing today. Uh, so so uh, the uh, topic of the talk is variational inference for learning probabilistic recurring neural networks. Uh, and, and particularly, we'll be talking about uh, applications in uh, for cyclone trajectory prediction. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, as we know, I'll just start by introducing the problem that we'll be uh, looking at. So, this is the cyclone trajectory and intensity data set that we are working with. Uh, so, you'll see that there are four uh, regions that we are considering, and uh, what we are looking at is the way we have classified these four locations is. Uh, based on where the cyclones originate uh, in the on the Earth's surface, and uh, this data was collected by uh, the JTWC, the Joint Typhoon uh, Warning Center, and we have pre-processed this data. We have uh, kind of uh, pre-processed it and created a data repository for this data, and that's what's being collectively used for a number of projects in uh, our group here. Yeah, so I'll start by introducing uh, what's the motivation behind this research. So uh, the idea of uh, predicting cyclone trajectories is quite important. So it's a, it's a multivariate time series uh, problem, which is very critical in uh, climate science projections. And uh, typically, uh, there are a number of traditional ways of predicting cyclone trajectories, but machine learning in particular has shown a lot of promise in this area and particularly uh, deep learning with recurrent neural networks has shown uh, a good uh, good uh, results in these uh, problems, right? Uh, but but the problem with these modern machine learning approaches is that they lack uncertainty quantification, which limits their uh, usability in real world applications. Uh, as I said, uh, these projections need to be accurate, but we also need to quantify uncertainty in the projections because. Uh, we can't perfectly accurately uh, predict where the cyclone would be at a given stage in time. So it's important to actually quantify uh, the uncertainty of the position and the intensity of the uh, cyclone so that we can actually mitigate the effects and damages uh, that are caused by these, uh, uh, by these cyclones. Right, so uh, Bayesian approaches are pretty common in this area, and we've uh, we've worked with these uh, approaches in our previous research as well, particularly with MCMC. Uh, but we've seen that MCMC works really well with uh, more simpler architectures, whereas in the case of uh, recurrent neural networks, where the uh, parameter space can be really high dimensional, these uh, methods tend to not perform very well. Right, which is why we want to look at some different uh, approaches for this problem. Right, so uh, variational inference in particular has been a good alternative to sampling approaches. Uh, variational inference provides an approximation technique to uh, estimate the posterior distribution of the parameters. And in particular, for neural networks, at least, variational infer inference has shown a lot of promise. Uh, in estimating the distributions of the uh, model parameters, right? So this is not really a very novel or new uh, approach for uh, neural networks. 
but it has not gained much traction and a lot of a lot more work needs to be done to actually make them applicable to more complex architecture right so here's an overview of uh, a patient neural network so what you see is that it's it's basically a neural neural network architecture with uh, full probability distributions at the places of the weights instead of a single point estimate of the weights we try to quantify the full distribution of the weights and that is used to uh, predict uh, to generate the predictive distribution of the model to quantify the uncertainty in the uh, model predictions right so particularly we'll be looking at uh, recurrent neural networks here's an overview of the architecture that we are going to uh, investigate so particularly we are interested interested in looking at the two architectures shown in the figures uh, one is the uh, vanilla rnn architecture where you see that the output is just a function of uh, the previous hidden states and the uh, new uh, uh, the input introduced at the time step t uh, and in the case of and the other architecture that we are going to be looking at is the NSTM architecture, which is a gated uh, recurrent neural network architecture, where we also have uh, three different gates uh, called as input, output, and the forget gate, which update the memory structure over here, referred to as CT, uh, which propagates long-term uh, memory in the architecture. Right. So essentially, in the architecture presented over here, We'll be replacing these blue layers with the uh, following two uh, layer structures. Right. So, uh, as I said, uh, our previous work has delved into uh, incorporating uncertainty in Bayesian neural networks. And uh, what we have done so far is we have experimented with different uh, learning approaches for uh, training the uh, Bayesian neural networks uh, through MCMC. Uh, we've come up with a, a number of different approaches. Uh, I've only mentioned some of the papers that we have worked on previously, but these are the ones that I was a part of, uh, while there are a lot more that uh, Dr. Chandra has worked on. Right? Uh, but uh, something that is common with all of these papers is that uh, we've only looked at very primitive uh, feed-forward neural network architectures, and we have not really examined these methods with uh, architectures like deep CNNs and uh, deep recurrent neural networks. And uh, when we did actually investigate, uh, try investigating these methods for those complex architectures, what we noticed was that uh, the MCMC methods that we developed for feed-forward neural networks do not generally scale to those complex architectures. Right, so to uh, so we had to look for another alternative for Bayesian inference for these complex architectures, and the literature is uh, filled with variational inference approaches for uh, these models. Uh, so this slide just gives an overview of the difference between the two methods. So the first uh, part over here is an overview of the MCMC. Uh, Estimation a sampling method for estimating the posterior distribution, whereas the second one shows uh, the variational inference method. Right. So in MCMC, what we generally do is we try to estimate the best uh, the uh, posterior distribution of the parameters using uh, by drawing samples from the posterior distributions, uh, which tends to be a lot more accurate uh, than any approximate inference uh, whereas in the case of variational distribution what we do is we start by uh, a variational family of distributions for instance uh, you could look at this distribution that's presented over here uh, the distribution clearly looks uh, like a multimodal uh, gaussian distribution maybe a mixture of gaussians uh, whereas what we do is we uh, try to estimate this distribution using a uh, single Gaussian distribution, and we try to find the best Gaussian distribution that fits this uh, data, right? So in that case, we are kind of restricting the shape of the distribution that we are trying to uh, learn from data, right? So there's there's a bias that's introduced by that. So the only thing that we try to learn is that what is the particular Gaussian distribution that fits the data the best. 
instead of actually learning the full industry. Right, so here's a probabilistic overview of the backpropagation algorithm that's used to train uh, modern neural network architecture. So um, what we know is that we can uh, treat a neural network from a probabilistic point of view, uh, where the prediction from a neural network can be quantified using the probability distribution uh, P by given X and theta, where theta is the uh, parameters of the neural network and X represents the input of the neural network. Right. So typically what we would do in this case is we would try to find the maximum likelihood estimation of the parameters theta, which is represented by theta hat. And uh, what we do is we basically compute this uh, arc backs over this log likelihood to maximize uh, the likelihood and uh, find the best value of theta that fits the uh, data. Right. Uh, and moreover, to introduce some regularization, we can uh, set a prior distribution uh, here. And instead of just maximizing the likelihood, we can also uh, maximize the prior distribution. And by this, we can, instead of finding the maximum likelihood estimate, we can also do maximum of priori estimation, in which case the objective function would look like the equation two presented here. Uh, where instead of just maximizing the likelihood, which is the first part, we are also trying to maximize the prior density. And this, this um, R max is achieved by a gradient ascent, or uh, in the case of uh, MSE law that we generally train our models on, it's done by gradient descent. So what is a prior? So prior is a prior belief that we set on the neural network parameters. That we say that we assume that the uh, neural network parameters are following a certain distribution based on our expert knowledge. Uh, we could set a prior that we could assume that the model parameters come from a standard normal distribution, for instance. Uh, but this prior distribution is used to uh, incorporate an expert bias into the uh, model. How have you set it up? In your implementation. I, 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 I okay. Right. So uh so now I'll just go over the variational inference approach that we uh, take to train these models. So we are using something called as base by backdrop approach, which is uh which was introduced in 2015 uh by a group at Google. Uh, so this approach basically uh, is a reparameterization variant uh, variational inference approach for uh, standard neural network architectures, right? So um, we start by assuming our variational distribution, uh, which is given by Q over here. And uh, we assume that the neural network parameters theta at any time are drawn from this variational distribution Q, which is parameterized by parameters delta. So the parameters delta are also referred to as the variational parameters uh, that we want to learn, right? So here's just an uh, example. What uh, here's just an example of this. So for instance, if we assume that Q is a Gaussian distribution, what we are saying is that U, uh, theta values, which is the neural network weights at any given time, uh, are drawn from a normal distribution. Uh, with mean mu and uh, variance sigma, sigma squared. And then we can construct an optimization problem of instead of estimating the parameters theta directly, we can try to estimate the parameters of this distribution, which is the mu and the sigma squared. And using those parameters, we can then uh, sample our uh, variational, uh, we, we can sample our neural net network weights. But there's a catch. Uh, because of this sampling process, uh, the uh, the sampling process itself is not uh, differentiable, which makes it not suitable for any sort of gradient optimization directly. Right, so we have to find a way to optimize these parameters mu and sigma uh, by bypassing this uh, sampling process. Right, so what we use over here is something called as reparameterization grid, which has been quite common in variational inference literature. And um, what we do is we instead of sampling from 
this distribution q we reparameterize the parameters of this distribution from mu mu and sigma to mu and rho we introduce a new parameter rho which is used to compute the variance and what we do is the uh, sampling step is then given by the equation three so what you'll see is that what we are doing is that we are trying to sample uh, theta from uh, we are, we are basically shifting and scaling a standard normal distribution over here. We sample epsilon from a standard normal distribution. We multiply it by the variance and we add the mean of the uh, desired distribution. So now instead of multiplying it by sigma squared, what we do is we multiply by rho and we introduce this new function on rho, which is called the soft plus function. Uh, and the only objective of this function is to make sure that the value computed for the variance is never negative. Because when we are doing gradient optimization on rho, it can actually go to a negative value. And using this transformation, we make sure that the variance that we are multiplying this noise by is always positive. Sorry. Yeah. I'm not quite understand why you said that something from the variation distribution is not differentiation. Yeah. What, why, what? So uh, in order to compute this, uh, in order to do a gradient descent on uh, the parameters mu and that uh, sigma, what we need to do is we have to actually compute uh, the gradients of the loss function with respect to these parameters, right? But when there's a sampling step involved in between, that, that's, that's not actually differentiable. The sampling function itself is not differentiable, which is why we do this reparameterization because now this theta value, when we try to propagate gradients from theta to mu and rho, this process is now differentiable for a specific value of epsilon. Right. right. So uh, now the objective is to find the best values of are uh, variational parameters mu and rho uh, that minimize the difference between distance between our the variational distribution and the true uh, posterior of the uh, parameters right so uh, and to measure the distance between two distributions the literature generally refers to something called a scale divergence uh, scale divergence is a metric to compute the distance between uh, any two uh, distributions right so when we write our loss function with, by using the scale divergence, the objective is then to minimize the scale divergence between the variational distribution, variational posterior distribution Q and the true posterior of the data given by P uh, theta given D. Right? And uh, when we expand the scale divergence, we can then rewrite this objective function as equation five. Uh, as shown on the screen. Right, so here what we are doing is we are expanding the posterior in terms of the prior density and the likelihood which we know and we can compute. Right, uh, now you'll notice that this part over here and even the KL divergence itself has an expectance uh, in it. So in order to compute those expectance, uh, we do an approximation and uh, the approximation method that we use over here is called the Monte Carlo uh, approximation, where we draw some random samples uh, from our variational distribution, and then we compute uh, these uh, prior densities and likelihoods on uh, those samples, and the aggregate is what is used as the approximation of the uh, true loss function. So as you know, like because we are doing this Markov sample, uh, Monte Carlo sampling, we uh, the this uh, equation at the seven, the value in the equation seven is only an approximation of the loss function, and it's not actually the true uh, loss function. But in in practice, this actually works very well. Uh, right. So uh, now this. The, the problem setting also requires us to define a prior distribution and likelihood for to optimize the method for. So uh, we use a Gaussian likelihood as our prior likelihood, uh, sorry, Gaussian uh, prior for our neural network parameters. Uh, we use a zero mean Gaussian prior with some variance tau square, which is uh, defined in advance. 
and then the uh, prior density is computed as uh, equation A shown on the screen. Uh, and the likelihood that we use is a multivariate uh, normal probability density function, which is given by equation nine. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to just minimize the uh, uh, signal error in our predictions from uh, the ground truth of the data. Right, so uh, once we've defined uh, these values, the loss function, we can use back propagation on this loss function uh, to compute, uh, to iteratively update our samples uh, for uh, values of delta and uh, delta, which is the variational parameters. And we can do a gradient descent on uh, these neural network parameters. Um, just a second, can yes. you go to this slide? Yeah, so in the MCMC formulation, we have this tau squared parameter for the noise. Yes. What do you have here? So uh, the one that yeah. you are referring to yeah, is, the, yeah. is the signal noise only likelihood, yes. which is gamma over here. And uh, in the MCMC iteration, what we've done is that we've kept this parameter trainable. But in this case, we are fixing this to a static value. I and see. that's what's being... Uh, so it's a hyperparameter. It is a hyperparameter. So uh, the tau square as well as the uh, uh, the gamma square and the tau square both are hyperparameters in this case. Right, so I now that we've covered the uh, methodology that we're working with, so this is, I'll just go over the data and the problem setting that we got. So, so it, seems, uh, it seems like one of the assumptions is that the distributions of the neural network parameters are all independent of each yes. other. There's no yeah. dependency. This, this is an assumption. That we're yeah, okay. And sorry, one other thing. It wasn't clear to me what the, is the only difference between the prior and the use of the variation, of the, the variation distribution is you're just drawing from different distributions. But in both cases, you're kind of making assumptions about the distribution of the parameters. Yeah, so with variational uh, distribution, we are only making assumption about the uh, family of the distribution. Yeah. Whereas in the case of uh, prior, we are actually setting a specific prior density okay. uh, yeah. to the models. But we've also experimented with uh, using multimodal or mixture uh, priors for this setting. So in this case, what we can do is we can also set a different type of prior where the prior is actually a mixture of Gaussians or something like that based on the problem setting that we are working with. But for this problem, we found that uh, a standard Gaussian was working the best uh, for our applications. But yeah, we can always play around with even the Gaussian, uh, even the variational family that you're working with and uh, as well as the uh, prior distribution. Mm. Thank you. So in the case of NCMC, you propose new values which are accepted or rejected, right? How, what happens in here? So in the case of uh, the major difference between variational inference or uh, and MCMC is that MCMC is a sampling-based approach, whereas variational inference is uh, approximation approach. In the case of MCMC, we draw directly draw samples from the posterior distributions, which is what we are uh, referring to as the acceptance and rejection of the samples. In the case of variational distributions, we do not draw any samples at all. What we are suggesting is that we have set uh, an assumption on the family of the distribution that the uh, parameters follow. And we are just trying to estimate the parameters of that distribution itself. For instance, if we say that the model uh, the model parameters follow a Gaussian distribution, in that case, we are only trying to estimate the mean and the standard deviation, uh, mean and the variance in the form of uh, uh, these mu and rho. So the only thing we are actually estimating is just two parameters instead of generating the samples uh, for the parameters. In the estimation process, like in MCMC, we use uh, Hamiltonian or Langevin gradients. How do you use gradients and compute the gradients? So this is totally an optimization problem at this point. We are not doing any iterative sampling at all. So the objective is just to minimize this loss function. And this can be done using a gradient descent uh, approach. And uh, all we have to do is just minimize this loss function and find the most optimal values of these delta. Uh, variational parameters. 
right? So then those optimized values can be used to draw the samples uh, for the uh, neural network. Because we know that what these parameters are uh, parameterizing. They are parameterizing a variational distribution, which can be used to draw this. That's the one to confirm. So for each of the parameters, do you know, do this? Yes. Okay. So we, for uh, delta here represents the collection of all neural network parameters in this case. So if we say we have 10,000 parameters in our neural network, we'll have 10,000 values in theta. But we'll have two into ten thousand because each parameter will be represented by two values. One will be the mean value mu, and the second will be the variance, uh, a proxy for variance, which is the. So uh, you are mentioning this base by back propagation, which is more for general feed for neural network. Yes. Can you explain how you implemented it for recurrent neural networks, especially by LSTM? So it's it's pretty straightforward from the uh, application point of view, but the framework itself is pretty general, which is what I've covered here. Uh, in the case of LSTMs and RNNs, the only thing that changes it's it's the architecture that we are working with, and the parameters theta. Uh, in the case of LSTM or RNN, the theta parameters are actually uh, parameterizing the recurrent connections in the model instead of a feed forward. Probably we can see the code later. Uh, right. So I'll just go over the uh, framework that we've set up to train these models for cyclone track prediction. So uh, for for each data set that we are working with, as I shown as I showed you in the beginning of the talk, we have four data sets that we are working with, and for each data set, we have a number of cyclone trajectories originating in that region. And uh, we have uh, recorded three values, essentially the uh, latitude and longitude, which represent the position of the cyclone at a given time step. And we have the wind intensity, which represents how intense the uh, cyclone was at that given point in time. And all of these values have been recorded at a six hour interval. So for this exercise, since we are working with uh, recurrent neural networks, what we do is, we use this uh, uh, cyclone data that we have and we generate sequences uh, for our model. And each uh, parameter that you see over here, latitude, longitude, and uh, wind intensity, it's represented using a vector given over here. And the length of this vector is t, which represents the t time steps that we have for individual uh, cyclone trajectories. And since we have three values, latitude, longitude, and wind intensity, J is taking either of uh, these three values, right? Uh, then we apply a state space reconstruction using uh, taken theorem and using a window size of alpha. And uh, then we can write for, for a given time step T in the data. Uh, the input is given by the matrix that you see over here, where we have the value of latitude, longitude, and wind intensity at t minus alpha time step up to t minus one time step. And the target in this case, because we are doing a single step ahead prediction, the target is just a single value of the these three values at time step. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so for the wind intensity, we are giving that the data is from ERA file or and also at each like level. So uh, I think this is, uh, I, I'm not sure, maybe Rohitash will be able to Six hours. No, but she's asking about the altitude of the wind intensity. Yes. Which is what I'm not sure about. Uh, we are just using the JWTC's uh, provided data. And maybe you can, uh, I'll refer to the data repository where you can go and check out uh, to see what the actual uh, height is. Right, and um, since the time steps that we have is like six hours apart, uh, what we do is we use four time steps as the input to cover a 24 hour period. And then we try to predict six hours further in time where the location of the cyclone would be. And so this is an overview of the uh, architecture that we've put together. Uh, so we get some raw data, and which is pre-processed by JWTC, and we do some of our own pre-processing on top of this. 
and we uh, generate these cyclone trajectories with these three values uh, referred to as x1, x2, and x3 over here. Uh, then we do some space time reconstruction of these uh, cyclone trajectories and we compute the input matrices and the target labels for these uh, uh, cyclone trajectories, and which is then passed to a Bayesian uh, recurrent neural network or LSTM, as we have discussed in the previous section. And then we draw some M samples of uh, theta from our variational distribution, which is used to compute M predictions, and then further we compute the uh, elbow loss function that we have shown, right? So uh, to evaluate this met method, we have used two metrics over here. So first one is the RMSE, which is a pretty straightforward root mean squared error, which is quite prominently used in uh, regression uh, applications. The second one that we use here is something called as uh, energy score. Energy score is a generalization of CRPS, which is also called uh, con con sorry, uh, condition continuity rank prob probability score. I think so. Yeah, the CRPS score is pretty commonly used in probabilistic or ensemble methods. Uh, energy score basically, uh, but but CRPS is used for univariate predictions, whereas energy score is generalized to uh, multivariate predictions. And uh, it's computed as shown in equation 12. So for instance, if we have M and ensemble size, and we are predicting, we are generating M predictions for the value of Y. Uh, for each value of Y, Y hat is the predicted value. And uh, energy score is computed as the uh, uh, formula shown over here. Right. So M is the size of the number of multivariate Values you're predicting. Yes. Uh, no, so M is basically the number of samples that we generate. Oh. So, in the case of variational estimate, we generate some M samples uh, for the predicted value. Uh, those that refer, uh, M refers to those different samples. Right. So, here are some experiment results that we have documented. Uh, so, uh, we show results for each of these four data sets. And we compare uh, our Bayesian RNN and Bayesian LSTM with vanilla RNN, vanilla LSTM. And in order to get these confidence intervals for uh, vanilla RNN, vanilla LSTMs, so what we've done is we've trained uh, 100 LSTMs and 100 RNNs. And this is uh, these intervals are generated using the frequency uh, estimations from those uh, runs and um, the first value here represents the mean of the prediction and the second value represents the standard deviation. And we also report the train and test energy scores. So what you see is that uh, we want to actually minimize the uh, both the RMSE and the uh, energy scores. And for most of the cases, you'll observe that the Bayesian LSTMs and Bayesian RNN provide a better estimation of the uncertainty in the predictions. Uh, shown by the smaller energy score in both train and test performance. And this is actually uh, common in all the four uh, <laughs> data sets that we have used. Uh, even in the case of uh, RMSE values, you'll see that uh, the Bayesian version provide a good estimate of these values and they are pretty close to the uh, values that we achieve from uh, multiple runs of RNN and LSTMs. So we can conclude with these results that we are actually able to go, provide a good approximation of the uh, posterior using uh, the variational method that we've introduced. So can I ask, sorry, is there, is there what, why do you have a single error metric when you're predicting three values and the met and two, sorry? Uh, it's the mean of the. It's the mean. 
Yeah, but you, I mean, they're two, they're, the units are different. Like, no, we have scaled them. So, so. Oh, okay, yeah. right. Yeah, so right. in the case of, so in the case of all the predictions, we have actually pre-processed our data. And during those pre-processing, we have actually standardized the uh, key values that we have. And we have, all of them have been standardized to follow a normal distribution with zero mean and single mean. Okay. And also the normalization that you did, did you, like you had, you are dealing with latitudes and long, longitudes, right? Yes. So you assumed that they started all the cyclones from the same place? Yes, that, that's another uh, uh, pre-processing that we did. Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So as part of standardizing the data, we also uh, recentered all of these cyclones. Yeah. So all of these cyclones are actually treated to have ori uh, on originated from a zero zero uh, location and a zero intensity in order to uh, make sure that there's no spatial or location uh, bias uh, in the model predictions. Okay, so looking at the results, in my view, I think uh, maybe your parameter tuning was a bit biased. Hyperparameter tuning was a bit biased for base. RNN versus RNN. Mm -hmm. I mean, theoretically, the results should be similar. Yes. You are being very fair. Yeah. So, so the reason that this looks slightly better than the RNN is because actually what we saw was that for the actual RNN, uh, we noticed that there was, in a lot of the cases, the model was stuck in a local optima, uh, which is where the loss value was actually really high the metric value was really high. And those actually drifted the model's prediction. So this is also another highlight of uh, the Bayesian RNN and Bayesian LSTM. Uh, these models were actually able to uh, overcome this issue in the standard vanilla RNN and LSTM, where we didn't actually notice that many cases where the model would have been stuck in a local optima. And the results were actually fairly consistent in multiple runs uh, of the training. In the literature, is there anybody who has done this? Like compared base RNN versus RNN? I don't know. No, right? And I, LSD I for up. other types of problems. Yes, I, I think we should do that in our group. Yeah, I'm not sure. I didn't come across many papers. Even coming up with a good metric to compare a, a vanilla version with a Bayesian version was quite tricky, and this is what we settled with. But uh, yes, the idea was to see if our model was able to approximate or provide a good approximation of uh, the uh, vanilla RNNs and LSTs. And the truth is that these models often get uh, stuck in local optimas, and uh, which is where these models show poor performance. Which is why, and at occasions, you can see like there's like really high uh, standard deviation in the predicted value. And this is particularly common with RNNs that we get. And an another thing to notice over here is that we kept the architectures exactly the same between the RNN and Bayesian RNN. So both have the same number of parameters being tuned, uh, but uh, the Bayesian version has uh, variational parameters, so it has double but the number of the parameters. training time, what was the training time for RNN versus Oh, sorry, that I am not sure we haven't documented that. Probably so. that's the one major reason. Yeah. Uh, but definitely, but definitely training a hundred RNNs is much slower than training a variational RNN, which is what we found in our experimentations. However, I do not have those documented here, which is no I, training yeah. time, I mean the number of samples versus number of epochs. Epochs, what the maximum epochs? Oh, so you mean the convergence time yeah. for both models? Yes. Uh, so uh, we actually did not keep that same between the two parameters, uh, between the two models, because we noticed that the RNN did converge quite sooner uh, compared to uh, variational RNN, because uh, variational RNN needs, needs a lot more uh, time steps to actually uh, estimate the variational distribution of the parameters which is why uh, this can be slower than training uh, one but, RNN. But how do you define convergence? Like you said, it converged sooner. Yes. 
what do you mean by that? that so so we, we just went with empirical results, right? So when we started to notice that the loss function has flattened out mm -hmm. and we are not seeing a significant improvement in the loss function, that's where we converged, uh, considered it to have converged into an optima and we stopped the chain. How, how much did you play with the learning rate? Uh, quite a bit actually, because uh, what we noticed that was that the Bayesian versions are actually quite sensitive to the hyperparameters, including the learning rate. And there are very specific settings where this actually worked really well. And there were settings where this did not work at all. Mm -hmm. So in the case, in the case where the learning rate was too high, the model did not converge at all. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'll move on to some more results. So Here's a trajectory prediction for four different cyclones uh, from our four different data sets that we've uh, documented here. So uh, the, uh, we compare our predictions uh, with the target and the uh, standard vanilla LSTM and RLS. And what you'll notice is that I think fairly all of these models are providing similar mean predictions. And uh, <clears throat> which is fairly close to uh, the ground truth, which is the uh, red line over here. Right, so I think this is common between all of these models and we can say that these are fairly good predictions uh, for Bayesian LSTM and the LSTM. Uh, but what we want to highlight with the Bayesian LSTM is that we also get the uh, added advantage of uncertainty quantification. And this is what uh, this is a picture that we've generated to demonstrate that. So at each time step, uh, we, we've we tried to present how the uncertainty is presented. So uh, the blue is the trace of the cyclone at a given point in time. Uh, these plus, the red plus symbol is used to represent the uh, target value at that given time. And uh, the black symbol is showing the previous value, the current value of the current state of the uh, cyclone strain. And, and what we've done is we've generated these contours that represent that uh, predictive distribution that accounts for that uncertainty in the predictions. And what you'll notice is that almost in all the cases, the ground truth is within the uh, bounds of that uh, the contour that we've plotted. So the contour that we plotted here shows the 95% uh, confidence of the um, normal distribution that we've generated. It's a multivariate normal because we are trying to predict two values at, at the same time over here. So uh, yeah, so predictions uh, of the contours are actually able to capture the target values for this particular. Sorry, just the so this one actually we did is uh, after we sample the, the the different uh method you are using right? or yes, I, uh, I mean like uh, because you mentioned the R and based on data and LSTM and yeah so this is this is using the patient LSTM okay. and what we have done is basically uh, we have drawn say hundred samples of the relational distribution and uh, using those hundred samples we've computed this. Uh, predictive uh, distribution score. So it's it's an ex estimation of the uh, two predictive uh, distributions of the model. So to conclude, uh, what we've done over here is we've presented a variational influence based Bayesian RNN approach for uh, quantifying uncertainty in uh, cyclone trajectory predictions. Uh, we compare our model the Bayesian version with single point estimates using the energy score metric. And um, the results show that the model is able to quantify the uncertainty really well and provide a good approximation of the deterministic counterparts. And uh, what we particularly uh, noticed as I highlighted was that the variational approach was able to introduce uh, the right amount of uh, prior in influence on the model learning and it was able to avoid this uh, local optima issue that we noticed in the single point uh, models. Right, so this paper was published in uh, environmental modeling and software earlier this year and is available 
if you want to give it a read. Uh, we have also uh, created GitHub repositories for the data and the model uh, used over here. I so, so we have created a GitHub repository for the model and document. Yeah. Okay. Right, so uh, the code is provided in PyTorch and it is available for you to clone and play around with if you would like. Uh, we have both the implementations available for Bayesian and STM and Bayesian RNN. Although these are fixed architectures over here, you can play around with it. Uh, and we've also provided some training scripts for these. Uh, right, and in addition to yeah, in addition to the software, we also provide the accompanying uh, data sets that we've used. These are open source, so it can be accessed by anyone. And uh, we have the four locations and the data uh, stored for all these locations. Could you go into the code and show how the traditional inference interacts with the LSTM or the RNA, like the passing of the information between them? Like, there is no passing of them. Like, how are the weights taken? And that's the critical part the weights encoded. Right, so uh, yeah, so for that we have so uh, we use something as called as the we have created our own uh, a different layer, uh, linear layer, which is the Bayesian linear layer. And what you'll see over here is that instead of having the weights and the biases directly, we parameterize this with uh, the mean for the weights and the bias and the row value for the weights and bias. Right, so instead of storing just the gates and bias, we have two parameters that represent the distribution of these weights. And we have then compute, uh, created our own, uh, uh, we've created this uh, Gaussian weights which do this sampling for us. And uh, that's what you see over here. So at each forward pass, uh, we sample from these weights and we compute this log prior and log duration. Posterior, as I showed in the uh, slides. So, uh, in the case if somebody wants to use a FNN or a CNN, use this with a CNN, how would they change the code? Finally, you'll have to create another model class over here, similar to the Bayesian LSTM that we have created. And in that case, you'll have to just define the forward pass of the model with uh, the new architecture. Okay. And that can be done for a simple neural network as well as and other models. Okay. Thank you, everyone. That. Right. Anybody has any other questions? Uh, any questions from uh, Rodney there? Any questions you have? Uh, I only had one clarification question, which was about equation nine, eight and nine in the presentation. Sorry, what is this regarding? Uh, equation eight and nine. Equation. Yeah, because they're basically doing the same thing. and. Yeah, yeah so the only like, difference between the two is that the, one, the equation eight is the... Uh, uh, normal distribution on the priors, uh, yeah. uh, normal distribution on the parameters, theta. Yep. Whereas so, the, yeah, equation so, nine is the same distribution, but a multivariate Gaussian on uh, this is trying to uh, encapsulate the signal noise or the epsilons. Uh, okay. the so why do you have the minus sign in front of equation nine? Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is a mistake. So uh, it's supposed to be okay. minus. Okay. Yeah. 
That, that was my question. Yeah, <laughs> so. that, 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 that's what I think. <laughs> they, they are basically the same, but just... just yeah, they should be the same, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Okay, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, can you go a little bit down to the, yeah, uh, I think it's uh, uh, still, still down. Yeah. 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 The, um, uh, two, yeah, the last, uh, yeah, this one. So, actually, uh, for the different, uh, the method, it looks like the top, top, top left. This one? Yeah, it looks like very different from the, uh, the other, other three. I mean, like the other three, they have quite con consistency. I mean, like the, the other three figures is quite consistency, but the, for the first, uh, uh, yeah, figure, there's a big yeah. variation. So, so what's the why it occurred this one? Is that in like probably if you add other like parameters, like uh, variables in the variables, probably it will improve or not? Because I know the expert of experts, uh, yeah, technical, so yeah. Like, so there could be many different reasons for this particular result that you see here. So this could definitely be that the data was not sufficient maybe for this particular cyclone that we've uh, generated. But although I think we have same amount of data for all these regions that we have trained the models on, uh, but yeah, this could have many different reasons for this kind of result. Uh, but the idea is not to actually do improve the predictions by a lot, but the idea was to actually just see if we are able to account for the uncertainty and provide some reasonable predictions uh, when we compare this to a uh, uh, vanilla version, and which it does, which in all of these cases, you'll see that the vanilla and the uh, variational estimated uh, models are quite similar uh, in the prediction. So the blue and the purple are the RNNs, you'll see that those. Yeah. And the uh, the yellow and the green are the uh, LSTMs, and they are big. So what's that, the, that's what we are trying to. Yeah. What's the observed uh, So so the red line is the observed data, oh. which is this middle line, and I think what's happening here is that uh, RNN is slightly overestimating the latitudes, uh, whereas the LSTM is doing a slightly better job at the estimation. I think a similar trend can be seen over here as well. So that is uh, the first one is of a single cyclone. Yeah, all of these are just single cyclones. Single cyclones. Okay. So I these see. are four different cyclone trajectories from four different data. Okay, this is interesting. And uh, actually, as a co-author of this paper, I would like to say that uh, there's uh, some other uh, extensions we want to do, and one of them is to go through. Extend is uh, look at a more of a explainable AI approach yeah. where we want to understand. So if there are cy hundred cyclones, some of them are predicting well the RMSC. Some of them will not be good. Like some of them will be like the first one not good. So why is it not good? Is it because the cyclone is going too straight? Uh, is it because of the curvature? Because we are this problem that we are looking at. Firstly, note that the variational recurrent neural networks in the literature, there's not much papers, right? So uh, just the paper on variational autoencoders, that is also not that old, you know? These things are all in the last 10 years, okay? So this field is quite new, although variational inference is quite long. So this is like one of the first attempts from our group and probably around the world, if you look at the software code, uh, which uh, Arpit has done, which initially he said that it's not a big contribution. And that's why we were not sure about doing this project in the big. So I convinced him, and we had our old discussion and arguments about this, that this is an important project because we are giving the software out for other people to apply variational recurrent neural networks and LSTM. And it can be very easily amended to CNNs and FNNs for general other problems. Whereas this problem is very specific and it's a spatio-temporal problem. So it's like when you see that cyclone straight, it's not necessarily that the recurrent neural network, uh, if we only had spatial problem, spatial prediction problem without the, uh, in terms of, so we have spatio-temporal, but we are looking at three things here of the cyclone. We are looking at latitude, longitude. So that we're looking at the spatial phase 
And then we are also looking at the wind intensity. So it's a combination of if it is going so fast ahead, but then the wind intensity is uh, maybe changing too fast, or there's some chaotic behavior in the wind intensity, then probably the RNN is having a problem in trying to model that situation. Yeah. So this we can only uh, know in the future with an explainable AI approach, which we are planning to do with this project and a related other project, which uh, Honghui is doing for pedestrian trajectory prediction. We want to know when the pedestrians, why the model is doing good for some of the pedestrians and not doing good for some of the others. And this is all, whereas pedestrian trajectory, you are only looking at uh, speed. Uh, so pedestrian trajectory prediction is kind of related to the cyclone trajectory prediction, but this is a little bit uh, different in the sense that our time taken is regular, right? Pedestrian trajectory, the time taken is also regular, but uh, the speed of cyclones moving is different. All the cyclones move at a different speed, and with the speed of their movements, the uh, intensity also changes. So it's a quite a difficult problem, but I think with the explainable AI, in both pedestrian trajectory and cyclone tra trajectory, we are going to get more information that will help us understand the nature of how people walk and also how cyclones move in the future. So that's one important contribution from this thing. And uh, good work, Arthur. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'll just stop the recording. I'd, I'd be really interested to see how the errors break down across the, the three dimensions. Uh, in the paper, we have that. Oh, okay. Okay, let's take a quick photo, everybody. Um, because uh, John is here.